I'm Joan London, and welcome to another edition of Miracle Babies. Tonight, an inspirational hour for the entire family. After a tragic accident, two-year-old Samantha Hudman had no pulse, no heartbeat, no sign of life. But these miracle workers wouldn't give up. Everybody in the room was just crying. No one wanted to stop. And then all of a sudden, we heard this, and Sam took a breath. It's a story that defies logic, the remarkable recovery of the little girl who was dead for three hours. And Rick and Diana Stafford had given up hope of ever having children. But fate intervened when the voice of a young Russian orphan touched their hearts and changed their lives forever. I know this sounds kind of odd, but I, I think he's meant to be our son. It's the unforgettable story of Vladimir. His eyes are bright, he's got this beautiful smile. You know, he says, Mama, Mama, Papa, Papa, I love you, I love you. And a couple's miraculous journey to parenthood. Uh -oh. Then, Jamie and Lynn Parks were the perfect couple. But a tragic accident almost cost Lynn her life. One of the nurses was instructed to get the forms for organ donation ready to have her mom sign. Jamie's unconditional love led Lynn to a miraculous recovery. And today, they are the parents of their own miracle baby. All true, all inspirational, all miracle babies. Welcome once again to Miracle Babies. Our show is about our most precious commodity, our children. For the next 60 minutes, you will see how the love of family, selfless acts of heroism by total strangers, and the marvels of medical science join together to make miracles. Our first story defies logic. When paramedics recovered two and a half year old Samantha Hudman from a tragic automobile accident, she had no pulse, no heartbeat, no sign of life. Today, the little girl who was dead for three hours is alive. This is her miraculous story. The small town of Waldo in southwest Arkansas typifies rural life with close families and lots of kids. 77-year-old Wendell Hudman had six grandchildren, but the youngest two-year-old Samantha had a special place in his heart. Samantha was his little uh, running buddy. When he would go somewhere, you know, he'd like to come out of the house, pick her up, or she stayed with him a lot. So it was not unusual that on March 11, 1998, Grandpa Hudman and Samantha went out for their daily drive in the country. Grandpa picked Samantha up that morning. He put her in the car seat like he always does. He was very protective. He always wore his seatbelt. She was always in the car seat, just always. In an instant, the routine ride in the country became a nightmare. Without warning, Wendell lost control of his truck, drifted off the road, careening into a creek. The truck landed upside down, both helplessly trapped in the seat. Frigid 34 degree water quickly flooded the cab. A bystander called 911. It took paramedics almost 20 minutes to reach the accident scene. The water was very muddy. You, you could not see six inches below the top of the water. So there's no way of knowing anything in the water. The rescue crew flipped the truck on its side, giving them access to the passenger door. The first thing they saw, an empty child's car seat. Don't see any kid in the seat. Looks like we're okay there. They cut the car seat out to get to the driver buried in the muddy water. No one was prepared for what happened next. Samantha's body floated to the surface. Hold on, guys. He's in there. She didn't have a pulse and she wasn't breathing. She was just real white, cold, you know, just limp, nothing there. Just, she was dead. Moments later, rescuers discovered Samantha's grandfather dead at the bottom of the cab. Julia started CPR and rushed the lifeless little two-year-old to the nearby Magnolia City Hospital 15 minutes away. 
we had a call from the ambulance stating that we had a child who had been underwater for 40 minutes. The child had no signs of life, and obviously we don't have this happen every day, so we were all quite disturbed and called what we call a code immediately. I really couldn't tell it was a girl. They had a blanket wrapped around her. She was still wet. She was just cold. You could feel the cold through, even through the blanket. No cold, no cold, guys. Samantha was brought in at 2.30 p.m., nearly an hour after the accident. Doctors and nurses worked feverishly to get any signs of life. Well, initially she had no heartbeat at all, and she was not breathing at all. We were trying to warm her little body because she had a core temperature far below sustaining life. We need some more warm blankets. All of us in the room were moms and dads, and you just pictured, you know, what if this was my child? And I could see, you know, this being my little girl, with dark, dark plastered hair to her little head, and her color was awful because she had been without a pulse. The nurses continued CPR. They injected drugs to try and restart her heart. They even tried defibrillation, shocking her heart seven times in a desperate attempt to get a pulse. An occasional faint heartbeat gave the team a glimmer of hope and a reason to keep going. But the pulse was impossible to sustain. As each minute passed, the odds for her survival were rapidly diminishing. The time went by so fast, it just seemed like, it, you know, we'd been doing it a few minutes, and then it was an hour and a half, and we could see our babies laying there. We could think, if it was my baby, would I want them to quit? And, of course, she wouldn't. Come on, baby, breathe. And I never will forget the minute that we'd been working on her for nearly two hours which is an extremely long time to carry out. I, I guess that would probably, I've been a nurse 20 years and that's the longest code I've probably ever been in. Finally, an excruciating decision had to be made. How long have we been at it? Almost two hours. Two hours. Let's call it quits, We were all just crying. Everybody in the room was just crying. And it was like, how can you stop? Just how can you stop? You could have heard a pin drop in that room. It was so quiet, no one wanted to stop. And then all of a sudden we heard this, and Sam took a breath. And it was like, she's breathing and I felt and she had a pulse and it was just like, a life was back in her, and, and we, at that point, we were cheering like we were at a football game. Everyone realized they had just witnessed a miracle. Samantha had come back to life. It had been nearly three hours since her grandfather's truck had rolled into the freezing water. The little girl's heartbeat was stabilized, but she was still near death and urgently needed more extensive medical help. The only facility that could handle such a critical case, the Arkansas Children's Hospital, was a hundred miles north in Little Rock. A trauma team was mobilized and Angel One was on its way. Back at Magnolia City Hospital, Samantha's parents were finally allowed in to see their young daughter. She still didn't have her color back good. She didn't look like my baby. <laughs> she was hooked up to all these machines and <laughs> I just didn't want to believe it was a hurt. I just, I wouldn't know how to put into words what I was thinking or feeling or anything. It, it was just the worst moment in my entire life. Two hours and 15 minutes later, Angel One arrived back at Children's Hospital with Samantha. Waiting for her in the pediatric intensive care unit was a medical team consisting of an internist, trauma surgeons, respiratory therapists, and specially trained nurses. We had heard how long she had had her cardiac arrest and how long she had been submerged. So we were expecting a child in a very deep coma in a very unstable condition. From their experience, the specialists knew there was little hope for survival, much less any kind of recovery. If they survive, um, then they are unable to wake up, they're unable to respond to their families, and have severe 
uh, brain damage, oftentimes to the point of being what we call vegetative. The doctors told me she was not going to live. And if she does make it, that she will never be the little girl that we knew. I just had to keep thinking that they don't know. You know, they said they don't know what's going to happen. And so I just had, I had to hold on to that. For the next 72 hours, the family held a vigil as Samantha wavered between life and death. And then another miracle. Samantha opened her eyes. She had come out of the coma, but the extent of the complications were still unknown. She wasn't able to walk, she wasn't able to eat, she wasn't able to do too much of anything else. She'd get really, really frustrated and she would just cry and scream and just, and there would be nothing you could do to calm her down, but at least she was there, you know, so we can, we can deal with that. <laughs> with a tremendous amount of help, Samantha slowly started to improve. We had a child life and education specialist who saw her and worked with her. We had the speech therapist, physical therapist, occupational therapist, nutritionist, rehabilitation, nursing. To everyone's utter amazement, the little girl that no one expected to live was making an incredible recovery. Just 37 days after she arrived comatose at Arkansas Children's Hospital, Samantha Hudman was ready to go home. A party for Samantha's homecoming was celebrated by family, old friends, and the new ones who had helped save her life. Only years from now will Samantha fully understand how deeply she touched the hearts of so many. Looking back on the accident, doctors suspect that a heart attack caused Wendell Hudman to lose control of the truck. Because the water was so cold, Samantha's body had gone into hypothermia, a drastic dropping of the core body temperature. But investigators concluded that something else happened in the freezing water that day, a dying grandfather's final act of love. The doctors told us that if she hadn't have been in that car seat, then there would have been bruises, there would have been broken bones from that truck flipping, and there was none of that, which also tells us that he had time to get her out of the seat, to get out of his seatbelt, and attempt to get out of the truck. Now, just two years later, Samantha is four years old. She runs and plays and shows no signs of the near tragedy she survived. I really think you have to describe the way Samantha has recovered as miraculous. For her to come out and be back to functioning essentially normally, um, I think is a miracle. This was the greatest thing that ever happened to me in all my years in medicine. I've been in practice for 40 years. I'd never seen anything like this. And I just kind of felt like we'd all been touched by an angel. Samantha, your story touched the hearts of all of us. We'll be right back. Next, Rick and Diana Stafford had given up hope of ever having children. But fate intervened when the voice of a young Russian orphan touched their hearts and changed their lives forever. I know this sounds kind of odd, but I, I think he's meant to be our son. It's the unforgettable story of Vladimir. His eyes are bright, he's got this beautiful smile, you know, and says, Mama, Mama, Papa, Papa, I love you, I love you. And a couple's miraculous journey to parenthood. Welcome back. Our next story takes us to the outskirts of Moscow, Russia, where thousands of unwanted children are living in orphanages, their spirits silenced by a desperate longing to be part of a family. But there was one powerful soul whose spirit could not be stilled. His name is Vladimir, and his voice would echo halfway around the world. 
Bye. For Rick and Diana Stafford of Cincinnati, Ohio, music and family have always been at the center of their lives. They met while playing in their college marching band and had their first date on September 23, 1982. They immediately fell in love. And from that point on, we'd been an item, and one year and one week later from that first date, we actually got married. The Staffords shared a love for family and imagined their lives would be filled with the joy of raising children. But by the end of 1989, after six years of being unable to conceive a child, out of desperation, they turned to infertility treatments. Each month began with promise and ended with bitter disappointment, leaving them physically, financially, and emotionally devastated. And I think that we just at one point decided that, uh, you know, it was too much heartache just to continue to try to do something that nature was not going to allow to happen. Just in, it, it was a, a lot of heartache. Time healed their aching hearts. And two years later, in the fall of 1991, their thoughts once again turned to creating a family. Only this time, they would try to adopt. They signed up with a private adoption agency, and one year later, a birth mother chose them to adopt her baby. It's a funny thing about adopting. Once you hear that, it, your heart connects to that child, even though you've never seen them. Sadly, the birth mother changed her mind and decided to keep her baby. It happened not once to Rick and Diana, but again, a second time in 1992. It was devastating. It was painful. It was hurtful. It was very difficult on us. It was a near tragedy for our marriage at that time. The pain and disappointment tore them apart. Rick and Diana separated for almost two months. When they got back together, they resigned themselves to life without children. But fate would intervene. On an early morning drive, Rick was in his car listening to a national public radio story about Russian orphanages. The day, December 1st, 1994. <laughs> There are several American parents who have nearly completed the adoption process. Reporter Brooke Gladstone had visited an orphanage outside of Moscow and spent time with hundreds of children who were hoping to be adopted. But for Brooke, there was one child who stood out from the rest. His name was Vladimir, a seven-year-old who had been abandoned by his parents at birth because he was afflicted with severe physical deformities. In the middle of the story, as I'm listening, and she says something to the effect of, and then there's Vladimir. Back, cheerful and bright, with withered and deformed hands and feet. The story ended with Vladimir singing a few lines of a Russian lullaby. There was something about this mysterious voice on the radio that touched Rick's soul. He felt an unexplainable spiritual connection to the little boy, and he immediately called Diana. I know this sounds kind of odd, but I. I think he's meant to be our son. I could tell in his voice on the phone that he was dead serious about this. But his heart was wanting to really do something for this voice that he heard in the background of the, of the tape. The Stafford search for the young boy led them to contact NPR reporter Brooke Gladstone in Moscow. Although Brooke admired Vladimir, she warned them of his severe disability. He slithered like a fish or a snake. He, uh, he couldn't sit up and he couldn't move straight. His knees were bent, his feet were clubbed, his hands were completely folded over. And I said, okay, well tell me about his spirit. Tell me about his mind, his soul. What, what, what did he, how did he come across this? Well, he's terrifically strong-willed. And he had no consciousness of being unlike the other kids or disadvantaged or strange. He was the oldest, he was extremely bright, and he was king of the hill. If, if his mind is there and his soul is there and he had a terrific spirit as she had described he had, then the rest to me was not that important. Rick and Diana contacted an organization called Cradle of Hope that specializes in overseas adoptions. They spent weeks filling out applications and forms. During this time, Diana admitted to Rick she was concerned about caring for a child with special needs. That was one of my biggest fears about getting pregnant. And so now I'm actually looking to bring in a seven-year-old physically challenged boy. 
One day, while Diana was home alone, a packet arrived. It was Vladimir's medical report. Before reading any information, right on the top of the papers was a picture of Vladimir. I looked at him, I looked at his eyes, and I just melted. And just to see the sweetness and the innocence, um, the gentleness, the sparkle, the life, just in this photograph was incredible. All of Diana's fears vanished. She and Rick agreed to move forward with the adoption, despite the fact that Vladimir's medical records revealed he was suffering from arthrogryposis, a crippling genetic disorder that ravages muscle tissue and joints and leaves limbs all but useless. I knew that I was gonna have to um, help feed him, help dress him, help bathe him. Basically, he needed help with everything, and I had no problems with that at all. But now they faced a much bigger problem, money. It would take $20,000 to cover the various expenses to adopt Vladimir. The Staffords simply didn't have it. They scraped together what little bits they could from friends and family, but it was far short. Let's see. References. Okay, so that's another $75 check. All right. An article appeared in the local newspaper that touched off an outpouring of love. Strangers sent checks. An airline drastically reduced its airfare. An organization donated a wheelchair to bring Vladimir to his new home. It was one tiny miracle after another. On June 2, 1995, six months after Rick first heard that tiny voice on the radio, he and Diana were on their way to Russia to pick up their new son. A home video camera captures the moment seven-year-old Vladimir met his American parents for the first time. Incapable of walking on his own, a caretaker lifted Vladimir so he could step into his new parents' arms. And he walks around the room, his little contorted body bouncing back and forth, and he's very energetic, and his eyes are bright, he's got this beautiful smile and his hair is all colicky and, you know, he says, Mama, Mama, Papa, Papa, I love you, I love you. <laughs> the whole room was crying. It was as close to a birth moment as I can imagine coming. Rick and Diana's lifelong dream of being parents had finally come true. They spent the rest of the day at the orphanage getting to know Vladimir and one of his most precious secrets. And, and little did we know that in his itty bitty little bed there in the orphanage, which was tucked in a corner, he will, would lay in bed at night and ask God to give him a family in America. His prayers answered, it was time for Vladimir to say goodbye to everyone at the orphanage, the only home he'd ever known, and travel to America with his new family one impossible dream had come true. When we return, his courageous quest to fulfill another. Miracle Babies will continue. For Richard and Diana Stafford, the long road to having children had finally ended with the adoption of a seven-year-old Russian orphan named Vladimir. But in many ways, their journey was only beginning. It was as though we'd never not been a family. It was as though it was always meant to be. Until Vladimir learned English, the new family found a way around the language barrier. I think it was a benefit for us not to speak the same language. And it, I think it helped us all to be more sensitive to looking beyond the words to the meanings behind the words. And there was one message Rick and Diana could clearly see in Vladimir's eyes, a longing to use his hands and feet like other children. His form of walking was to use this part of the, of the uh, clubbed hands, and he would put them behind him, and he would just, really, he looked like a seal. Rick and Diana took Vladimir to Shriners Hospital for Children in Lexington, Kentucky, which donates medical services for families in need. They basically did x-rays of his entire body, head to toe, and we evaluated uh, the hands, the elbows, the knees, the hips. The news wasn't good. 
Vladimir's condition was far more severe than they had ever imagined. His elbows were locked straight and head couldn't be bent. His wrists were bent as far towards his forearm as they could go and couldn't be straightened at all. Dr. Burgess had a plan. He would surgically implant into Vladimir's gnarled wrist this torturous looking contraption of rods and wires called an Ilazarov device. The Ilazarov would work like a mechanical cast to straighten his deformed hands. In the summer of 1996, one year after coming to America, Vladimir underwent the operation to insert the stainless steel spokes into his hands. Rick and Diana would then have to do the unthinkable. Four times each day, they would have to turn the tiny screws, which would pull on the rods embedded in his bones and slowly help raise Vladimir's hands from their severely bent positions. It's a little difficult to sit there and literally be ratcheting your child's arm straight. Um, it's tough on parents. They drew their strength to cope with the pain they were inflicting on Vladimir by watching their son bravely endure it. Two months later, the device was finally removed, and the results were amazing. Vladimir's twisted, useless hands had new life. He underwent intensive physical therapy to increase strength and flexibility. Using his hands will always be difficult, but it is a vast improvement over how they once were. Thrilled with the results, doctors plan to use the same procedure on Vladimir's deformed feet. In October 1996, as doctors made the final preparations to implant the device, they reviewed his x-rays one last time and realized the device could never correct his deformed feet. Vladimir's only hope of ever walking was to have his feet amputated. We can both address his foot problems with an amputation. I felt a lot of shock because it was not even something we'd considered to that point. That was a decision we, we felt from the very beginning would need to be a decision that he would have to make, which as a 10-year-old was going to be extremely difficult. Vladimir made the most difficult decision of his young life. On March 31, 1997, he underwent a complex 12-hour surgery. The medical team not only amputated his feet, but also corrected severe problems with his hips and knees. Six months later, his legs healed from the surgery. Vladimir now faced the difficult and demanding task of learning how to walk with his new prosthetic limbs. Hi, Pop. Hi. Say, so today I'm gonna, I'm gonna put on my feet. Okay. This home video shot by Rick and Diana captures their son's strength and determination. I'm a funny one, I have to stand up. <laughs> Okay. He was terrified. What he was anticipating was getting into these plastic things and feeling a lot of pain. So he was just beside himself with fear. What have you got your faucet turned off this way? <laughs> <laughs> and once he was able to get into his prosthetics and give himself a couple minutes to calm down, he realized this this isn't as bad as what I thought it was going to be. It, doesn't, it didn't hurt at all. You know. oh. Vladimir stood motionless for nearly 15 minutes, steadying his nerves and gathering the courage to do something he'd never done in his life. I got you. Walk. <laughs> Gentle words of encouragement from his mother urged him on. I can't do it today, Mom. Sure you can. Finally, the moment Rick and Diana never thought they'd experience as parents. At 10 years old, their son was about to take his first tiny step. Try, 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 try. Oh, there it is. Oh, good. Okay, now, I want to miss you. As he was able to grab onto the bars and take his first step, it was just beyond words. It has been nearly three years since Vladimir took those first steps. Today, at the age of 12, he continues to conquer mountains. He's learned English and continues to make progress in using his hands and legs. His spirit inspired Rick and Diana to adopt another Russian orphan, Nadia, who's afflicted with the same congenital deformities as Vladimir. They feel their family is now complete. Uh -oh. To have a family was uh, very special, very important. 
in a sense it completed us, it made us, it brought all the pieces together. I would definitely say we believe in miracles. Although Vladimir will probably always have to rely on a walker for assistance, he's come a long way from that tiny Russian orphanage. When I was in the orphanage, I wanted to have a family, to have a father and mama. He has put the past behind him and even forgotten the words of that sad Russian lullaby he sang on the radio that fateful day. It's been replaced by a new song, one of endless hope and possibilities. He's got the whole world in his hands. He's got the whole wide world in his hands. He's got the whole world in his hands. <laughs> Our thanks to the Stafford family, mom, dad, brother, and sister. Stay with us. Next, Jamie and Lynn Parks were the perfect couple, but a tragic accident almost cost Lynn her life. One of the nurses was instructed to get the forms for organ donation ready to have her mom sign. Jamie's unconditional love led Lynn to a miraculous recovery, and today they are the parents of their own miracle baby. Welcome back. A baby girl named Anna Lynn Marie Parks came into the world on August 23, 1999. There were no complications, no life-threatening emergencies. In fact, it was a normal delivery. But the road that brought her parents to this day was anything but normal. And the birth of Anna Lynn is nothing short of a miracle, a miracle that can only be explained by the power of love. When Jamie Parks met Lynn McGovern 14 years ago, he knew in a heartbeat his life had changed forever. I knew within you know, a very short period of time that this was, this was someone really special. Hard to imagine how things could keep getting better, but it just kept, uh, every day was better than the one before. Like everything else in his life, Jamie put his courtship with Lynn on tape a video diary documenting each moment of their fairy tale relationship. So, with his home video camera in one hand and a ring in the other, just two months after he met Lynn, Jamie was ready to pop the question. You did it! You did! You did it! <laughs> then we'd come in and she'd say, Aren't I the luckiest person in the world? And I said, You sure are, you know. She uh, couldn't say enough about him and she really loved him. So I knew that this marriage would be a good one. As Jamie and Lynn planned their future, they both agreed that raising children would be an important part of their life together. They picked a date for the wedding, October 10th, 1987. But just five months before their wedding day, this love story took a tragic turn. On May 9th, Lynn's brother was driving her to pick up Jamie to go to a baseball game. While making a left-hand turn, they were hit broadside by an oncoming car. I waited for her and waited and waited and waited and she wasn't there and I thought, well, I wonder you know, if something happened. Surprisingly, her brother suffered only minor injuries but Lynn was completely unconscious when she was rushed to nearby Olympia Fields Hospital. The diagnosis? Severe head trauma, massive internal bleeding, broken pelvis, collapsed lung, and a lacerated liver. Then when I got there, they ushered me into this little room, and her mom, Lynn's mom was in there, and uh, I said, how is she? And Lynn's, just the look on her mom's face just told it all. This woman was the, the best thing that ever happened to me, and, and I just, I didn't want her to leave, and I, it, it hurt so bad inside. It just was tearing me apart to see her going through this. While a surgical team worked nonstop to control the bleeding in Lynn's brain and abdomen, Jamie and Lynn's families waited for any sign of hope. None came. There was actually a point where one of the nurses was instructed to get the forms for organ donation ready to have her mom sign. 
There was nothing more doctors could do but wait. Lynn was on her own. Jamie and Lynn's families kept a round-the-clock vigil that stretched into days. Then, more than a week after the accident, the first signs of hope, Lynn opened her eyes and moved her arms. She was reaching out of the bars. This was the first movement that she made. Miraculously, Lynn survived. She was transferred to a rehabilitation hospital and three months later returned home to her mother's care. Hi, beautiful. While Lynn's eyes were now open, they stared straight ahead, showing no recognition of anything around her. I love you. Day and night, Jamie pleaded with Lynn to talk to him. Days became weeks, weeks became months, still no response. By now, it was October 10th, 1987, the day they dreamed of. But instead of celebrating, Jamie recorded this message for Lynn. Today was supposed to be the day we were getting married. But we, you know, we've had a little setback. And I had to postpone it because, you know, you're not quite up to par right now. Jamie's love grew stronger. He sensed Lynn understood pieces of her life, even if she couldn't express it. He knew she would get better. Then suddenly, as Jamie's camera rolled, Lynn amazed everyone by turning her head voluntarily for the first time. Okay, $100, buddy. Oh, Tom, how you doing? Oh, uh, $100, Oh, 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 began to make real progress. Still, no one was ready for what happened next. My son came in and he used to say to her, say Mike, say Mike, hundreds of times, and she would never say anything. And that night, it was two o'clock in the morning, and she, he said, say Mike, and she says, Mike. And he turned to me and he said, did you hear that? And I said, yes, I did. And he said, well, have you heard it? I, she must have said it. For the first time since the accident, Jamie could talk to Lynn, and Lynn, slowly but steadily, could talk to Jamie. It was the breakthrough everyone had been waiting for, but there was still a long road ahead. Lynn began a grueling schedule of physical and speech therapy. The progress was slow, and this once vibrant and physically strong woman became frustrated. She was treated for depression, and finally she told Jamie he should move on. He shouldn't wait for her. I said, uh, you know, if you would have given me a good reason, you know, I'd have left. But, you know, this, what happened to you is not a good reason. So as far as I was concerned, it was going to keep going and it wasn't going to stop. Jamie and Lynn renewed their love and began to rebuild their lives. They set a new date and planned their wedding. But this time, Lynn had one condition. Her goal was to walk down the aisle, and nothing was going to stop her. And so she worked just tirelessly. And, you know, four, five, six hours a day, she'd practice walking. After countless hours of rehab, seven years after her accident, Lynn was ready to take the most important steps of her life. I was so proud of her and watching her come down the aisle, and I wanted it to just keep going on and on. It was a very good day. I mean, it was like one of the happiest of my life. I was just glad to be with Jane finally. 
I mean, it took us a long time to get there where we got, finally got there. Jamie set up house together, and their life settled into a pleasant routine. As Jamie worked his daily shift for the post office, Lynn continued with her physical therapy. The dream of having children now seemed out of the question because of the massive injuries Lynn's body had suffered. There were so many reasons not to have a baby. Um, the main, my main concern was was Lynn's ability to actually go through a pregnancy and. And, and go through childbirth. But life was full for Lynn and Jamie. They had each other, their dog, Shale, and an exciting new hobby. Jamie, an avid runner who runs five to 10 miles a day, decided he didn't want to leave Lynn behind. Using a standard wheelchair, Jamie and Lynn became a team and a familiar sight in the neighborhood. Soon, they were entering races. We were really slow, but you know, we finished and then sort of, I don't know, sort of caught the bug. You ready? Lynn and Jamie even ran in the Chicago Marathon, finishing in the top 3% of all runners. But the love story of Lynn and Jamie doesn't end at the marathon finish line. In January 1999, seven years after their wedding, Lynn and Jamie discovered that Lynn was pregnant. For obvious reasons, it was diagnosed a high-risk pregnancy, and Lynn was carefully monitored by her doctors. She carried her baby full term. We pick up our story on the 23rd of August, 1999, at Christ Hospital in Oaklawn, Illinois, where, of course, Jamie had his video camera. having a baby. There's me. How you doing? After only three hours of labor, Lynn delivered a healthy baby girl, Anna Lynn Marie Parks. Hi, Anna Lynn. You were fantastic. You were wonderful. You're so cute. She is. <laughs> Two days later, Lynn and Jamie brought Anna Lynn home. I love being a mom. It's the most wonderful experience I've had. I didn't know it, that there could be so much joy in the world. As far as feeding the baby and holding her and, and, uh, and bathing her and, and stuff like that, we didn't know until she was, till Anna Lynn was here. Uh, how that was going to work out, but uh, it's uh, it's worked out fine. I've been able to do everything, so I'm happy about that. Anna Lynn has even joined her parents as the third member of the Parks family running team. For Lynn and Jamie, this is the culmination of a simple love story. A love story with a few miracles thrown in. I met the, the woman of my dreams and, and fell in love and got engaged. And even though we didn't get married for a while because she got hurt, uh, eventually married her. I mean, it's, you know, it's been 14 years since we met, but this whole process seems like it happened just in a flash. And here we have this, this little baby now, and, and it's just amazing. He's a pretty girl. Here she is. Hi. It's more than amazing, Jamie. It's a miracle. We'll be right back. <laughs>